And we are live on the Frugal Crafters YouTube channel. It was quick today. It hopped right up there. Um, I'm Lindsay, the Frugal Crafter. We're going to do some projects here today with watercolor. I feel completely out of sorts. <laughs> We're doing a painting. What am I talking about? Sarah's here. Hello. <laughs> She'll keep me on task. Oh, right. <laughs> I've been so distracted this week. I'd go to do something and then Jason would be working on my website and he'd be like, he'd be like how do you do this? Or, or what do you think about this? And I'd get completely distracted and forget what I was what I was doing, but I'm going to try to stay on, on a task today. We're going to use Yupo paper, which is a very thin, you can see this very thin synthetic paper. So it's like a really thin sheet of plastic and, um, and it's really interesting stuff. It will take watercolor. Uh, a lot of people have been using it lately with alcohol inks. This has been around for a while. I bought a big pack of it back in the late 90s when it first came out. And um, and it's, it's a lot of fun to play with. And a few people had asked me for a tutorial with it, so I thought that would be kind of fun to do today. We're gonna use some inexpensive watercolors. Um, the thing with the Yupo paper, it's, it takes it doesn't absorb any water. So whatever you put on it is gonna stay on the surface. So if you use a, a paint that's really heavy in a humectant, like honey or glycerin, um, like more of your expensive paints are, it can be tacky. Like the surface can feel tacky for ever. Um, kind of like putting your paint on a palette. I mean, it's because it's plastic. So I'm using these inexpensive watercolors by Prima. Um, I'm using the Decadent Pie set and then I do a few extra pans in the middle from some other brands just because the Decadent Pie is a landscape set and um, I put some brighter colors in the middle just for convenience. Uh, but you can use whatever you want. Your, your cheaper paints are going to perform a little bit better on this and we're also using some watercolor pencils. I've been having lots of requests for watercolor pencils lately so um, these were really fun to use on this. I didn't even know that this paper would take watercolor pencil but it did really well. And one other thing I want to show you is that I am using a few photos from this book, The Artist Photo Reference, and um, these photos in here are designed and your permission to use them in paintings. And I just wanted to show you how the, probably the best way to use a book like this is to take bits and pieces from different pictures. So like I took these cactuses, I kind of used that um, uh, uh, like mesa, I don't know what you call that. It's kind of like a rocky mountain in the desert. Um, and I used um, this one here, and I was looking at some of these colors too. So I used a bunch of different references for this one picture. And um, I thought I, I might use these colors in the sky, but I changed my mind and decided to keep it a nice bright blue day. So when you're using a book like that, um, try to try to make your perfect scene by combining images. And you can do that whether you're looking at pictures on the internet or you have a file of magazine clippings that you've collected. It's all going to work really well. Um, what else do we want to say? I think we got it. Okay, if you have a question, type the word QUESTION in all caps and um, either the moderators will answer it or Sarah will relay it to me. And I try to keep your questions Yupo related, watercolor related, watercolor pencil related, kind of in this realm so it will be super useful to the replay folks uh, watching later on uh, today or in the future. So we're going to start off by sketching. I am going to use a brown watercolor pencil for this. To begin, I am going to divide my paper kind of in thirds. So we're going to have this area here, which is like the kind of sandy cliff, dune, whatever. Um, I have a feeling I'm going to paint things like completely inaccurately because I am, I've never been to the desert, kind of like people that live, have never seen the ocean painting a lighthouse, but I'm going to do my best. Um, so I'm going to get this cliff in here. And I'm actually sketching from my painting. Um, so I did my painting from the photo, from the various photos, and, I'll, and I'm doing the sketch for my painting. So the, the end result will be something completely unique to me. And I think that's kind of another fun way to work, working from your own sketches so that you come up with something completely unusual. I'm using very little pressure and it's grabbing that pencil really well. So um, that's kind of neat. And I want to sketch on some cactuses. I'm going to use a green for this. Um, these are kind of like a like prickly pear cactuses. So you can have some bigger ones towards the bottom and some smaller ones kind of coming off there. You can be real whimsical with this because this is not the type of project where you get tons of of uh, of control and detail. Uh, you're going to be kind of letting the paint do its thing, which is a lot of fun. And nothing hard to sketch here. We've got jagged lines and we got circles. Everyone can do this. I had a, when I first did um, I did this picture to practice, 
I sketched it all out and then I had watercolor and nothing would stick. It was all beating up and I was like, oh no, I thought maybe my paper had gone bad. Uh, but then I flipped it over and I tried it on the back side and it did and it took the paint on the back side. So before you begin sketching, if you're using UPO, you might want to just quickly just wipe a sw like a, a swash of watercolor over it and make sure that it's sticking. And you can wash it off afterwards, rinse it right off. It's not going to hurt anything, but um, but that way you'll be able to... I want to make this come a little bit lower. You'll be able to make sure that it's going to accept your, your sketch so you don't end up doing a, a really big sketch and then not be able to to paint it. I never had that happen to me before. It was very unusual. I was glad I was testing it and it wasn't on the uh, on the final one. And I want to put a couple of rocks in. So I'm going to do one over here. Make sure it has like facets to it. So um, it'll be interesting to shade. We'll put a couple up here in front of the cactuses. And yeah, I think that'll work out pretty well. Um, for brushes, I suggest you use something that doesn't hold a lot of water. So like a Royal Langnickel Aqualon or Majestic. I linked the Majestics up below because they're, they're at a better price right now. So there's really not much difference between the two brushes. I actually like the Majestics a little bit more because they come to a finer point, but mine are downstairs in my studio. And I'm going to grab a little Ultramarine Blue and a little bit of phthalo blue as well and i'm just going to kind of swirl it in the sky and you can kind of see how this paint behaves it it uh on the paper it just it's very it's like painting on your palette except it's not beating up and you just get some really interesting effects and what's really fun about it is if you leave it while it's wet and you come back to it, it's going to be a little different when you come back because everything keeps shifting and moving on the surface. And if you want to put a little bit more of that, that uh, phthalo blue in here. And then for clouds, this is really cool. So you can blot up your clouds like we would on a regular paper towel, on a regular um, watercolor paper, or but you can actually twist and lift. You can be a lot more aggressive with this paper because it's so strong. So you can, and you can keep playing with these clouds until you absolutely love the way that it is. And you can even change your mind two weeks from now and go back in and get rid of the clouds and repaint them. So it's a complete reworkable surface unless you were to like varnish it or something. I want to add some color around my clouds, I think. Now you are going to have to be careful when you're painting uh, an area next to an area where it's wet because it stays wet for so long. But that's really um, the major consideration. You can go in and, and re-wet areas if you want to soften them or encourage them to flow. It's just so much fun and it's a great way to loosen up if you feel a little fussy in your painting. Right. I'm gonna leave that there for now. I know I can come back in and soften stuff up later if I want, but um, but I think I'm just gonna just not gonna fuss with it too much. It can get very since you can keep fussing, it's very tempting to go back in and and fuss a lot. So then I'm gonna skip down to um, the this like rocky area in here next. I think I'm gonna switch to a angled brush or any flat would be fine. And I'm gonna grab a English red. You could use um, Indian red. No, you don't really have to tape your paper down either. I just have it taped down here in case I want to tip it and I don't want the thing to bend. But you don't you don't need to. It's never going to warp or wrinkle on you, which I think is a really fun um, fun quality of this paper. And it comes in different weights. I just have the lightweight stuff because, like I said, it's not going to warp or um, wrinkle. So you don't need to have a heavyweight paper unless you just want one because maybe you're using it. I don't know, as a car, like a, as a layer on a card and you want it thick for whatever reason. But if you're just worried about it like wrinkling or warping, it doesn't matter. Get the thin stuff. It's cheaper. 
if they still make the thin stuff, they might not even make it anymore. This was a long time ago when I bought this. Uh, Carol, Ashley, mm -hmm. how long does it take for a watercolor on UFO to finally dry? It depends how thick the paint is and how much water you use. Like my M. Grams would take weeks to dry um, on this and they would still have, if I used it like the paint really thickly, I would get like a, a tacky film. So, you know, I, I just, I would stick to a paint that's not really, that doesn't have like the honey in it. So I wouldn't use sommelier. I mean, you can, but um, if you have other choices, I would use like something that's a little bit less, um, that has a little bit less of a moisturizer in it. If you look at your paints in the palette, you, ones that look really shiny, I wouldn't use those. Uh, Molly McAwesome, what watercolor set would you recommend based on the reusability of the containers? Oh boy, uh, lots of watercolors come in little tins like this, and those are really easy to refill. Um, this one here is the Prima Tin, and I have some Lucas watercolors in the center. And the reason they're in there is because I didn't like the tin the Lucas Studio ones came in, because it was a plastic container, and then the little half pans went in it, but every time I opened it, because the container was hard to open, they would fling out. So I just took um, a few of them that didn't repeat colors I had in the set and just put them down that center track. And on a lot of the metal tins, the center track is not wide enough to fit another row. Uh, so those are the, the Prima tins, which is uh, which is nice. And uh, they're not very expensive. And to buy an empty tin costs probably about 10 to $12 of that size. And the whole paint set only costs like $17. So, you know, it's a, it's, that's, it's reusable and it's a good deal. But, you know, you could look at the palettes online and see what, you know, what set you like best and then then go from there. Everybody has their own uh, their own preferences. Something. Oh, sorry. Go no, ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I'm going to use these silicone tools to kind of um, smush and scrape my paint around, get some interesting textures in here. Uh, Ian Jackson, have you used any Oxgall with it? Uh, no, I haven't used any Oxgall with uh, with the Primas or with the paper. He didn't specify. I'm assuming the paper. No, I haven't spe specifically. And um, uh, the Primas also move quite well, even on a regular paper. And I have just a scrap here. But like if you wet the paper, then you drip the paint in it, it moves pretty well. So I think it probably has a pretty high level of Oxgall in it. I can't be sure, but... Um, but I really don't think you would need it on this because this paper is going to move a lot anyway just because of the, the type that it is. Something you want to be concerned with or just avoid is using a heat gun with this unless you're going to hold it way back um, because you can warp the paper if you heat it too much. And I wouldn't use a hairdryer because you're just going to blow your paint around. So you do have to kind of wait a bit um, and be patient with this sometimes. Amber Kleinchen, would you seal this once it's done? Will the paint scrape off or frame behind glass? Uh, I definitely frame behind glass with a mat so it doesn't touch a glass because if it touches a glass and you have any condensation, it's going to um, it is going to stick. And come off of the paper. Um, I did spray the ones I did with the M. Graham because the um, the paper was the paint was so sticky, especially the, like the violets. And I would do like I use a lot of purple. I love their purple, but it was really sticky. Uh, but other than that, now I, I wouldn't. I was just I'm kind of more afraid I would like pick it up and leave fingerprints on it if I didn't spray it. And you could just use any sort of uh, fixative, artist fixative. I'm putting the sand here with Naples yellow. And I'm just going to leave a, just a, a, just a sliver of dry paper between those colors. And I'm not sure what Prima calls these. They have some probably fancy, like, fantastical name for them that aren't the artist pigment name. So I'm just going to use... The um, customary names that artists would call these colors because if you're following along with a different palette at home, I want you to know what, what I'm using here. I added a little bit of yellow ochre into the mix and I had a little bit of um, English red on my palette with some ultramarine blue and that's giving me that bit of a grayish color. And I just want to get some shadows around the rocks and just a little bit of variance in color here.
And after, like when I'm done, if I peel up the tape here, I can just take a wet brush and pull down the color into those corners so I'm not gonna end up with, um, with anything weird. Now, I think I'm gonna move this up a little bit closer so you can see what's happening to the paint in the sky as it dries. It's, uh, it's doing some pretty interesting stuff. So hopefully I'm not gonna be bringing it a focus, but we've got some interesting, just like, um, they're kind of like little cauliflowers. It almost looks like um, mineral deposits, the way that the colors are kind of spreading around on the surface. And you don't really see how your paint's gonna end up looking until it's dry, which is something that's kind of fun and really helps you loosen up if you've been kind of either stuck in a rut or you just get too fussy with your painting. Charlie Arts, what is the composition of UPO paper to make it act the way it does? I believe it's 100% PVC, like the stuff that your pipes are made out of, your PVC pipes. I'm giving the sand some texture with my paper towel. But it's funny that one side of the paper did not work for me today and the other side did. So I don't know, I, I don't think there's any coating on it to make it accept the paint, but maybe it's got like a little bit of a... Um, a texture to it it feels very it feels almost like that mineral paper or the rock paper if you've ever used that but it's not so draggy if you run your finger across it it just feels like a smooth a smooth matte plastic but um but it's really neat it works really well for for uh, what it does and um i think i'm gonna grab my color pencil i'm gonna grab a brown and i think i'm just gonna kind of play in this while it's still a little bit wet and make some more lines here. I forgot to link up the um, these little tools, but what they are is just silicone nail tools. They're a heck of a lot cheaper than the um, than the uh, the color shapers that they sell for artists. And I will go ahead and put a link after the broadcast. I'll put it in the video description so you can find it. I'll go look through my orders and figure out what what one it was that I bought, so you can find the same ones. But there are some duplicate ends in there, so you could probably split a pack with a friend if you um, if you had a friend who painted and you wanted to get that. Now, you can use a heat tool if you're really careful with this. And I want to work on the cactuses, so I am going to um, very carefully use the heat tool. So what you want to do, I wouldn't use my Marvy embossing gun because that's extra warm. But I would hold it at a distance where if you're holding this right directly on your hand like that, you don't feel like you're going to get a burn. It feels like like you're warming your hands at a campfire. Okay, you don't want to get it closer than that. And if you start to see your paper like move, then you probably want to even pull it back further. It's kind of like if you've ever tried to heat emboss acetate, if you're a rubber stamper, it's kind of the same idea. And I just need to go long enough to get the uh, paper around the cactuses dry. You can see it wants to like puff up a little bit, so I'm just being really careful that I don't uh, that I don't overheat it and melt my paper or warp it. There. That's enough for me to work in on those cactuses. And I am going to grab a round brush and I'm going to grab some green gold here. And let's go in and, and give these some color. Now you can actually, like if you, if you lost the round shape, you can kind of scrub at the edges and bring that round shape back. If that area though is still wet where you're trying to scrub into, you're gonna end up with your colors morphing into the background, which actually might look cool. I mean, don't it, play and try and, and have fun with this. The awkward maitre d' is UPO like palette paper. Um, not really. Palette paper is a plastic coated, it's more shiny, it's a plastic coated paper paper and um, the, your watercolor would beat up on that. You could use acrylics on this too or airbrush um, and it would it would take that just fine. You wouldn't get flowing, like you wouldn't get a blending crazy like this with acrylics. You'd get just a really smooth surface to work on but you, you could use it on that too. Vanessa Swindell, have you ever used UPO for stamping? I have. I've got, I think I have a blog post from oh, probably like 2009 where I took um, some stamps that were like a botanical theme and um, like pressed flowers and I inked them up with watercolor and stamped on UPO. It was really pretty. 
or I might use watercolor markers. I don't remember, but I remember stamping on the Yubo and actually I didn't need to seal it, which I was really surprised. I thought it might require some sealing, but since it was just such a small on media, it uh, handled pretty well. And I did a video last year using peg stamps um, with the Yupo too. So there's a couple that I can think of right off the, right off the top of my head. Now I am leaving some areas because I want to mix up a little bit of a teal color. I'm going to use the Thalo blue and a little bit of that green gold. A little more Thalo blue there. And I'm going with a darker color than I intend because I know it's going to, as soon as it touches the other color, they're going to blend together and get lighter. You get a really, your colors look super vibrant on this, even if you're using a student grade because, um, there's it the the paint the paper is so white and it's so reflective because it's smooth like that you're going to get a really pretty result and you don't get much shift because look i mean look how i mean that's wet look how dark my dry colors are i mean there's like no shift in there between wet and dry because the paper does not absorb anything it's actually drying quicker than uh, than the first one i think the heat must be uh I don't think it's as humid. Maybe it's dry out today. I woke up this morning and I was all like, I was like <laughs> my mouth was all dry, my lips were all dry. I was like, oh my god, I need some water. And we didn't have the heat up. Yeah, it is pretty dry. It's pretty clear out today too. Yeah. And maybe I'll take a little bit of yellow ochre and a little bit of phthalo blue. Maybe a little Naples yellow. I want to have a, a lighter green here. That's not really light. Let's grab a little more of that yellow ochre. And then we'll grab the, our uh, watercolor pencils and we will add some movement with that. And you can use whatever watercolor pencils you have. I'm using um, the Spectrum Noir Aqua Blends, which are, I was looking them up this morning, and I keep seeing these packs of 12 that are like 20 something bucks, or but the packs of 24 are like $24. So I don't know if they're repackaging them and gonna make them less in a pack for the same amount of money or what, but, um, but I've always been pretty happy with these. They're what I have in my uh, my pencil rack next to my Prismacolors, right next to my table all the time. And um, they're, they don't seem to break. They have nice thick leads and they're not crazy expensive. So I've been really pleased with these. The natural set would give you everything you needed for this tutorial, but the primary set's also nice to have, uh, especially if you do, if you want to do a variety of different types of work and not just landscapes. And all that info is in the video description. Oh. I don't want to add a little, another little bit onto that. You can really play with line, and I really love that. It's just it's so fun to experiment. You can use different shades of your green. You can dip the pencils in the in water real quick and bring them over to the paper, and that gives it a neat effect too. You can kind you can make highlights by adding down color, like this is a, a pretty light green, or it, you could scrape away some color, which would give it the highlight because it would bring you back to the, the white of the paper. And working in abstract fashion like this, it's, it's a really freeing. It's just a lot of fun. Even if you don't particularly care for the, you know, the look of the abstract landscape, it's still worth giving it a try just because it's, it's fun. And I'm going to do the same over here to these cactuses. And we don't really know how it's going to look until it completely dries. Reshape if you need to, just by wiggling that brush around and grabbing your, getting your edges the way you want them to be. Wetting it beforehand like I just did there will, you know, let the paint be a little more fluid. This is just the green gold on its own. Such a pretty color.
and it's completely changeable. So if you decide that you want something different, you just go in and re-wet the area and repaint it. And it's not going to lose um, the freshness. Like with your traditional watercolor paper, you kind of, you don't want to keep going in and reworking because then it gets very fussy looking or the paper gets worn out and starts to pill. You do not have that worry with this. Can even go in maybe with some blue over here and it's not going to care it's not going to hold the lines as well while it's really wet so if you want to impart the pigment from your your pastel or your you could use watercolor crayons if you don't have um, watercolor pencils that's absolutely fine um, so if you don't want to have as much of a linear look then do the uh do this step with the paper being really wet so there's a the difference you look here and it's really smushy you look over here and the lines are distinct if you decide oh i wish it was like that all you have to do is grab your brush with some water on it and just start tapping tapping the water here and there you can get rid of any of those lines and you can make it more mushy like it is over there if that's what you want if you want it more like this and just wait for that to set up a little bit and then go back in with your colors and you can you can make that happen and i think when i was using the upo a lot it was in the summer because i was using the full sheets which were like i think it was about 30 by 40 sheet 40 inches they were humongous and i'd have them laid down over my uh, pool table down cellar and probably part with it being in the basement and being summer that's probably why it took extra long to dry okay so i'm gonna work up here for a little bit keep skipping around to a dry area and you can I mean you can use your mimic brushes the only reason I was mentioning using a brush like this is because it's uh you're not gonna end up with more water than you bargained for especially on a student grade set sometimes they're harder to con reconstitute these are pretty easy but like if you were using a Cotman you might have a little bit more trouble reconstituting although I still don't see why people have such a hard you know give Cotman such a bad rap I've never had a really a problem with it You can reshape your mountains a little bit. You will be getting some of the green into your, what do they call that, Sarah? Is, it a, is, it a, is that what a mesa is when you have those like rocky mountainy things? I believe so. In the desert? You did, you, you lived in, in uh, Albuquerque, didn't you? Did you have like deserts all around you? Oh yeah, it was, it's all, but with a ring of mountains around us, you could always see the rain come in when it would, you could just literally watch the storm clouds move across. Oh wow. Was it, were you in the city? Albuquerque yeah. was a city, wasn't yep. it? Yep. Take a left turn at Albuquerque. I keep thinking of Breaking Bad whenever I think of Albuquerque now. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully that's not what it was like. Uh, no, not at all. No, <laughs> no. I'm adding a little bit of this uh, purpley color that I made. I used the English red and the um the ultramarine blue and it just gives you just like a really dull earthy purple throwing i was throwing that in for a little bit of tone the thing is i want to have a little uh, distinction between this kind of um, rocky area and that rocky area so um i'm using more reds orangey colors there and i'm using more yellows with purpley shadows further back and i think i actually think i want a little more color in there yellow ochre here so we got yellow ochre naples yellow and then just some of that dirty purple mix from the palette and i am going to use this uh this kind of as a squeegee these silicone brushes to to scrape in some highlights basically just squeegeeing your paint around The nice thing about the brushes that have the acrylic handles is that if you forget them in the water, you're not going to you're not going to hurt the brushes. I wish they had more of the like the faux fur brushes with the acrylic handles because that would be perfect cuz I've ruined the handles on some of my mix before leaving them in water too long. Now, I think I think I might actually grab kind of a deep whiny purple color pencil and do some of the um, details in that back mountain. I have the, the floral set of the Spectrum Noir blendable pencils have a lot of those, um, have a lot of pinks and reds. So they wouldn't really be that useful 
on their own unless you did a lot of florals, but um, they're nice. Prima has, has very similar pencils, um, but they're, they're more expensive and uh, they're a little harder to find. I, I have them and I enjoy them, but when I go looking for them, it's hard to, hard to locate a store that has a reliable stock of them. I like that the pencil, you can kind of keep a line. You know, if I was to go in there with a brush, it would just kind of float out because of all the wet the uh, wet paper. But with the, the uh, pencil, I can keep the line a little bit easier. This is a little brighter than I want, but I'll be able to tone it down with a paint. I'm also making the lines on these cracks and shadows going uh, vertically, and I have these other lines going horizontally, so hopefully that'll also give me a little more distinction. Oh, this one's a little bit better actually. This one is called Dasman, whatever that means. Uh, Dazzle and I don't know. Uh, Michelle Connell, what paint colors did you add to the middle of the decadent pie tin? I used um, these are all the Lucas Studio um, pans, and I have ultramarine, phthalo green, um, Hans yellow white. Uh, then I have probably cad yellow hue, ma magenta, um, cad red hue, and I think that one is burnt umber. They're from the Lucas Studio set, um, but that palette was very problematic, so that was my solution. All right, I'm going to switch to a flat, that same angled flat, and I'm going to mix up a nice gray. I'm going to go, there's actually this um, brown, it's kind of unusual, it's very, it's not as red as a, like an English red, but it's still quite, quite red. So I'm going to take that, and I'm going to take some of the green gold, and some of the phthalo blue. It's going to give me a nice dark. And I'm going to add that to some of those pencil shadows. And tone them down a little bit. And I'm using the chisel edge of the brush. Holy cow, you're typing like crazy over there. What is happening? What's going on? What just, am I missing uh, out chatting, on? Just chatting <laughs> with Joe and Gail just about uh, New Mexico and stuff. Oh, cool. Do we have any folks from out there? Um, I don't know. Nobody is. I don't think so. Hmm. That does mean there isn't. They just haven't said anything. That's true. I think I am going to grab a little of this magenta. Mix it with some ultramarine. Or actually mix it with that phthalo blue there. And maybe a little bit more of that magenta, a little bit of the English red. That's going to give me a nice neutral, um, kind of like a, a warm wine color. I feel like I've gotten all that way too wet. I'm going to go and blot a little bit of that out. And scrape in a little bit more with one of these tools here. Follow your instincts with this project. You're going to get some uh, nice visual texture when you scrape around with these tools. Uh, we have a Lindsay T from Arizona. Oh, cool. So she's familiar with this landscape. <laughs> Uh, I bet the weather's nice out there right now. It's nice and sunny. I hope so. Be in the 40s tomorrow. I'm looking forward to that. Not looking forward to the icy mix that's coming, but at least it'll be warm-ish. Yeah, I think I might scrape little bits away.
Okay, and I think I'll add in a little bit more of the uh, Naples yellow. It's all reworkable, so. So don't fret, don't worry. Lindsay says the weather is beautiful and the sun is shining. All right, we all need to go get in the get in the bus and go visit Lindsay in Arizona. <laughs> We're coming. We're gonna take a bus. You know, just added a little more shadow of that dark uh, gray brown color that we mixed at the bottom there, just to help pull it apart from the red. We'll leave that be for now we can come back to that in a little bit so for some texture on the sand we're going to grab an old toothbrush and we're going to spatter some of that so you don't need quite as much water as you would if you were um you know typically spattering if you spattered onto wet uh, a wet surface you're not going to get spatters at all you'll just get a little mottled look and you can go right over your rocks because you can Kind of smear that out after. I'm going to grab a little bit more of a that yellow ochre. Do that on its own. Build up some good texture here. With this paint, it dries with a really nice matte finish. So, like the if you have some white paper like the clouds, it, you're not going to have like a difference between the finish there and the clouds and the paint. Um, with a with a paint with a lot of honey in it, you're going to end up with more of a. Um, you're going to be able to see. But once you frame it, you're not going to notice it under glass, but you would see the difference in the sheen. Like if you're using Organza Tambay paint where you have the, um, where you have that, it's got that kind of like a resin in it or something that makes it a little shiny, that would give you a little bit of a, you'd be able to see that difference from where the paint was to where there was no paint. Uh, Amy Wazwaz, has Lindsay ever counted how many watercolor sets she owns? Does she still get excited at new sets? Yes, when I was conmarring my craft room, I did not get rid of any watercolors because they all spark joy, and they still spark joy. And I saw the new Prima sets <laughs> that are coming out, the, and they were sparking joy before I even had them. I don't even have them yet, so they all still spark joy. I have way too many. I don't even know how many there are. <laughs> Maybe I'll count them and put it in the video description or in the comments or something later. If anybody wants to take a take a take bets, take guesses. <laughs> A betting pool on. I will stay out of it. I have a key to the house. I could sneak in any time to get an exact count. <laughs> yeah, I like them. I don't know. And I thought about that. It's like, because I'll, every once in a while, I'll like just be like surfing the web, like, hmm, you know, wonder what they have for watercolors over here. And, and it's like, I don't need any more. But, you know, and yeah, I can't stop looking. We all have that thing. Yeah. I was just listening to the Minimalist podcast this week, and, there, and the topic was collecting. I was like, oh, <laughs> maybe I should listen to this. <laughs> but these things serve a purpose, and they spark joy, so. And, I mean, you know, you use them. It's not like you're buying them and stashing them and not using them. And you're not buying, you know, five or six sets of them, you know, of all the same thing. Except for my teaching. I do have a teaching, like, well, a yeah, box, that's, and that's all that's, for classes, that's but... different. That's... So, you know. All right. So that was just a little Naples yellow on the top. Um, for the shadow, I'm going to grab um, phthalo blue and that uh, weird kind of chocolatey brown color. And I'm going to add that towards the bottom of the rock. So let's see what it does, because I know there's some wet paint around there, so we might have some interesting surprises just want to give oh go ahead uh carol actually how do you decide which set to use for each painting um well some sets have um but a particular color family that i like like the decadent pies sometimes um i just haven't used a set in a while and i want to use it um a lot of times I'll see if I can find this set inexpensively before I use it. So if I see that sommelier paints are like on sale, you know, for $50 rather than $100, I might use those just because I can say, well, these, these paints work real good and they're, you know, not too crazy expensive right now. 
Um, but a lot of times it's kind of what what do I feel like what do I feel like using? I feel like there's not a huge amount of difference between paint sets, but there you know there's subtle differences that make them better for certain topics. Like um, if I'm plein air painting, I love Sennelier because I can keep layering and layering and layering, and I because of the way they layer, I don't tend to overwork. Um, a painting. So if I'm like sitting on the beach and like it's really bright and sunny, I might not be able to see everything very well, like very clearly, and my eyes might get tired. I know if I keep layering, I'm not going to ruin the picture. It's still going to come out Wait. looking good. Uh, Candy Kelly, can you use masking fluid on Yupo? Oh, you know, I never have because you can wipe it like, like you could use a Q tip and just like wipe out a little sliver so easily. Um, I, you know what? I don't think you want to do that because I think when you go to rub it off, you would definitely end up wiping out your paint under, like, next to it. I think that, I, I don't think there's enough of a bond between your paint and the paper to withstand that kind of, um, that kind of abuse, that kind of friction of removing it. So I haven't done it, but I, I don't think it's going to work as well as on paper. Actually... Do you find a lot of differences in the color family in different sets? Um, it depends. You should be able to see when you buy a set what um, what colors come in it. Um, the the paints that are set for the craft market, like this this paint set is designed for the craft market. Um, so it's designed for a lot of you know folks that aren't really going to mix colors. They're going to take what's offered and they're you know they're going to grab a probably a set of paints for a project like they're coloring a stamped image and they're designed so they keep coming out with new palettes but there's no duplicates in the colors but they're arranged around a theme so the color selection and this is going to be a lot different than if you get like a Winsor & Newton set of 12 when you get into the art paints a lot of times you'll get the set of 12 and then if you were to go get the set of 24 12 of those colors would be repeated so um it's just you just want to read what they what they come with and different companies will come with different colors like I got a set of um Holbein paints and the colors were just kind of different than than other brands and it was just a it was oh like those oh, sharpen oils I used last week that color selection was completely different than what I would expect um on like a on like a uh, kind of introductory set of paints but it was also meant for landscape painting so you know that's gonna determine what they put in there watercolors you're you probably will be a little bit more likely to get like an ultramarine blue and a permanent rose and an alizarin crimson you know some of those colors just because like they'd want to give you the most useful ones and the most light fast ones and you don't have as many options with pigments with watercolors if you want them to be light fast because they don't have the protection with watercolor of like a heavy binder such as oil or acrylic so they're a little bit more cautious with the pigments that they use um, when they're making a watercolor paint but, um, you know, I just, just whenever you're going to buy something like that, just read what the, uh, what the color and uh, selection includes, because there's not like, um, like a standard thing and different companies have different ideas about what should be included in a set. Hope that made sense. It's probably just convoluted. Uh, Grace Blosser, you tape the edges. Are you worried about tearing? Oh no, the paper will not tear. It's it's really rugged. Um, I just taped the edges in case I wanted to tip the whole board because this is a really flimsy paper that if I was to tip one edge, I could end up with everything kind of going into the center. So that, that's the only reason I just tape, tack down the edges. Uh, let's see. Oh yes, yeah, so I'm going to make some color to kind of go in here. I want to chunk up the rocks a little bit. I'm using ultramarine blue and English red. And I'm just going to, I'm looking at this. I'm not really looking at my um, sketch so much. I'm just trying to think, how can I break up these rocks so that it would make sense? And I'm using the chisel edge of the brush so I can kind of keep that horizontal um, lines, like in the sediment there. I'm 
I'm going to grab an orange pencil, dip it in some water here, and add a little more color. On the dry paper, it'll grab pretty well. Over the dried paint, it doesn't grab so well, so just need to dip it uh, into some water to get it to move on the dry paint. You can even dip it in the wet paint that you have on your in your painting too. And remember, anything you go over, you're going to reactivate what's underneath. So just kind of keep that in mind as you're working. If you absolutely love an area, then I would leave it. But just know that nothing's final. You can always go back in and rework something if you're not happy with it. Amy Wazwaz, how do you feel the Prima watercolors compare to more expensive paint? Um, well, they release color really easily, so you've got a lot of color. Uh, you don't have to work hard to get the color out of the pans, which is um, a kind of what, what a lot of student colors, like a lot of people say about Cotman, it's harder to get the colors to re-wet. So you don't have that issue there. They probably put like a detergent in there or a lot of oxgall or something to give it that property, but um, the colors are really vibrant. Um, they're not as transparent. I mean, they're transparent, but they're not very tra as transparent as like an artist grade paint i wouldn't call them chalky but um but you definitely would see like a little bit of a haze if you painted on black paper you'd be able to tell that, that there was um like a little bit of of uh chalkiness there but you don't really see it on white paper it's not like um i'm trying to think of a chalky paint that other people might have worked with it's they're not they're not really chalky uh, but they definitely are not quite as transparent as like um, like a Mission Gold or uh, Windsor Newton or Rembrandt. But they're good. I mean, for the money, the, the drawback is that you don't know what the pigments are in them. So, you know, I mean, they, they have some light fast ratings, but without the pigment information, it's very difficult to trust them. I would get kind of really compare them to the Sakura Koi. If you like the Sakura Koi paints, these are very similar. So if you've ever used those, like the Koi pan sets, that I would almost say they're the same paint. They they behave very similar. Okay, I want to go back in and work up here. Um, We've still got some wet areas there though. So let me blot a little bit. Actually, I might blot in there a little bit too for a little texture. And I am going to mix up another dark and go into that flat brush again and try to get some good shadows. I'm gonna go with both blues, my ultramarine and my phthalo. And I think I'm going to add a little magenta to that. There's also um, magenta in the tropical set from Prima. And a little bit of English red. Basically, I'm just going for a really dark, kind of purpley gray color. And I'm just going to kind of tap in some shadows. I want to get like the um, uh, the cracks between the rocks and, and harsh shadows cast by the desert sun. And when possible, kind of I try to separate the two bits of mountain. These are pretty contrasted in color, so 
doesn't need a ton of it, but it will help give a little bit of depth and perspective to the scene. Kind of divide up the different chunks of rock. I'm trying to set, decide on my next set of watercolor paints. Rembrandt, 48, or Senlier? Um, I would say it depends on how you like to work. If you like to work more... They're both great paints. You really can't go wrong with either of them. But um, I would say if you like to work, do like botanicals and lots of layers, then the Senlier will probably be a little bit better for you. If you want more like um, intense color immediately in one layer than probably the Rembrandts, but they're both, they're both good. I mean, it's completely up to you. I have the Rembrandt set of 48 and I really like it. And I have a Sennelier, I have like a set, I think it was, I have, ew, I have the Le Petit Aqua, Aquarelle set of 24 and I have the, um, a set of, it was like 12 plus six. I think you could still get it online for a pretty good deal. And then I added a few like other colors to that, but um, yeah, they're they're both good. I mean, subtle differences. When you get into artist paints, artist quality paints, I feel like the differences are pretty subtle. Amber Clingen, could you do a line and wash on this paper? Will ink stay put? Yes, you could do like um, if you did your line with a sharpie or with a micron, it would, or an acrylic paint pen. Now I'm going to add some highlights on to these rocks. I'm going to do some yellow ochre. I'm actually going to pull this tray out so I have a little more mixing area here. Because I might want those other colors so I don't want to clear them off. Uh, some yellow ochre here and a little bit of... Maybe I'll just do the yellow ochre actually. And... I'm just going to highlight, break up some of the lines that I had there. And go in with a yellow pencil. This is, this pencil is kind of like a Naples yellow. And add some highlights that way too. And I'm going to grab um, that English red and a little bit of ultramarine. I don't want this super soupy. I'm gonna, uh, yeah? Go ahead. Uh, Ian Jackson, which would you have, a set of Prima Crafty watercolor paint or a good student watercolor? Um, you know, it really depends because if you are getting a student set like Cotman, um, the colors might not reactivate as quickly. However, the pigments they use are a little bit more, um, light. Well, I don't know if they're more light fast, but you know what they are and you know whether they're light fast colors or not, where you're not really sure with the Prima. I think if you're working in like an art journal and you're not going to be like hanging stuff on the wall, then I would go with the Prima. But if you are really concerned with light fastness, then I would go with the common. If you, you know, or some other student grade that has the pigment information. Uh, Pixie Picks, how permanent would the mermaid ink brushes be on this paper? Um, though, uh, if you mean permanent, like, would they wash away? Yeah, they are reactive with water. They might stain the paper because they are a dye. Um, so you might end up with, like, uh, if you paint it with them and then you try to wash it to do something else, you might have a little bit of staining. Um, as far as light fast, they're not light fast. It says it right on the um, right on the packaging, which I appreciate them being honest about that. Uh, so they're not permanent in that respect. If you did some artwork on it, you probably want to photograph it and um, preserve it that way. Make prints if you, you know, if you wanted to have something to 
keep for the future. And I'm using a brown colored pencil and I'm kind of pulling in some of that mountain color in around the, uh, the cactus here so that they don't appear to be cut out so you can see that they're kind of that's behind there. I mean, totally, you can use whatever you have for paints on this paper. You don't need to go buy a special, uh, a special paint or anything. All right, now I'm going to get my rocks. Oh, I want to show you this texture, too, up close. Um, hopefully the camera can pick it up. The texture here from all the different spatters that we did is really neat looking. It looks almost like a stone uh, effect. I think it's really kind of cool. Um, so I just wanted to bring that to your attention. And also I like what happened here in the cactuses as the uh, different layers of paint dried. It's just got a neat, neat effect. Okay, going back to the flat brush to kind of chisel our rocks a little bit. I'm just gonna scrub it a little bit and put some highlights in. And over here too, because I was confused as, as to whether the cactus was on top or the rock was in front. I think the rock should be in front, so I'm just re-sculpting that. Just wiping it out. And I think I want to go back in and sketch a little bit there. And I think I'm gonna I'm gonna do a little sketching with some brown, but then I'm actually gonna go in with some magenta because I feel like that would be kind of fun to to add. Just kind of really give a little life into the whole scene. I think I might throw in some other little rocks. Sometimes you see things are made by the uh, the shapes of the way the paint dried, and you can totally go in and use that. Put a little rock in there. Oh, I like that. And your synthetic brushes have a little bit more of a stiff bristle if I, like this, well this is what, I don't know if you can tell that one's versus the um, more of the softer brushes that are meant to mimic real fur. They're just these Golden Taclon synthetic brushes are just a little bit firmer, so you can manipulate this pigment even more. Wipe out your highlights. It's like an undo button. It's like paint with an undo button. Mm -hmm. Gotta love that. So now if you do want to add color on top and you don't want to really uh, da like uh, lose what you have underneath, just use your paint a little bit thicker. It's going to be thin enough so that the paint will flow. But... Uh, Thick enough so it doesn't just reactivate everything and let everything just kind of slip around, slip and slide around. Uh, Rebecca Edwards, where do you get your watercolor tins? Oh, I've, all different places. If I need an empty one, I get them from Amazon. I've used the Meaden brand before, and the, and that works really well. And you can get them with or without the half pans in them already. I've always, when I got my big Meaden tin. Um, they didn't have the half pan option, so I had to buy my half pan separately, and I got them at through Amazon, but it was from Jackson's Art in the UK, and uh, those worked out really well. They're pr pretty standard thing, a pretty standard item. It's, they're just kind of hard to find for whatever reason, or they're really expensive, but Jackson's had a good price through Amazon. Um, but like for paints, I mean... Sets are usually cheaper through Amazon, but then refilling, like getting the individual tubes are usually cheaper through like Jerry's Autorama or Blick or Cheap Joe's. So I shop around. Paul Adams, I have a full sheet of Yupo. Can I tear it down like watercolor paper or do I need to cut it down with scissors, scissors or a paper trimmer? You need to cut it. It's not going to tear. So now I'm using this magenta color to kind of add a little bit of life into my shadows. You can also use it to kind of draw the eye through the scene. It's kind of, you can also use it to like add like the little prickles on the cactus or even just add some lines. 
around because it the magenta is like the opposite of the green and it just gives it a little bit of life I'm gonna grab some of this teal tealy color blue again and I dipped it in some water I'm gonna add that here and there in my cactuses too to give them a little bit of fun linear qualities remember this is an abstract so you paint however you feel I feel cold, so I'm painting a desert. <laughs> all black. I'm pregnant since February. Babe. Just, a just all black. <laughs> <laughs> it's the shortest month when it feels the longest. It really does. And I keep seeing, like, Facebook, you know, sends you those, oh, your memories from one year ago. Yeah. It's like, oh, I was in the water with a dolphin a year ago. Oh, that's right. You guys were <laughs> and I was coming to feed the cat shoveling snow. Oh, my gosh. So much snow. I feel so bad. That's I fine. Thank goodness <laughs> John had a plow. I don't even... Oh, well, man. yeah, we did that in the snowblower. It was fine. I just, I was glad you guys were having a great time. <laughs> <laughs> That's so kind of you. <laughs> kind of sad, too. I want some more magenta in there. I'm going to dip my pencil in the, uh, the other thing I, I have to say about, because because recently I hit a clearance sale and I bought all these glitter inks and I never would have paid full price for them. So I was kind of questioning myself, should I have bought them? Because if it's not something I would have bought full price, how badly do I want them? But I was having, I've been having so much fun this week playing with them because they aren't precious. And like my, probably my favorite watercolor pencils would be my Albright Drawer full set. But they're so precious, they stay in their tin all the time because I have to wait for something special enough to use them on. And I should know better because I'm always telling people to use what you have. But it's like I, I use my like these here because like well they're not that expensive if I have to replace them and you know I feel like oh I can dip them in water I don't have to worry about it um because if like something happens and I leave them in the water which you know I I haven't done yet but you know <laughs> it's only a matter of time um you know they're not too precious I don't have to worry so much about them so I think you should buy the supplies that you're not going to be afraid to use don't buy something that's so precious that you're never going to take it out of the package and that's that's one of the benefits of working with a student grade or crafter grade supply is it's not so precious. I'm not saying just go waste your supplies, but you know use your supplies. That's not wasting them. I feel like it's starting to come together now. We're getting through the hot mess stage. You start to see a little bit of a direction or a little bit of pattern in the mountains after a while. And then you can start to uh, to be a little bit more deliberate with your with your shading and with your composition. Really, working from a couple reference photos at a time is really I think it's a great exercise. And I think I might actually I usually don't do this, but with this being kind of like an experimental piece. I think I'm going to grab some a color I haven't used yet. I'm going to grab some of this bright yellow. I believe it's a Hansa yellow. And I'm going to put some of that in my cactuses. Because I know it's going to stand out a little bit. It's different than anything else I've used. Plus, whenever I tap it in there, I am reactivating the paint underneath and pushing it out a little bit. So it's like I'm putting that that yellow directly on the paper. And then you don't know exactly what's going to happen because the uh, as the paint reactivates and then redries, it's going to give you different um, different textures and different looks. It's just such a fun product. Now I think I want to maybe do a little bit more of the teal color, so I'm going to use some thalo blue. I'll do the thalo blue right in that lemon yellow, actually. Uh, your head's actually getting in the way of the oh. camera, so people can't see what you're doing. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> oh. Okay, I'll stand back a little bit. Um, so I'm going to grab a phthalo blue, this uh, lemon, I think a little bit of that green gold. Oh, that's pretty. I'm going to kind of dab it. I'm going to keep the edge of the cactus in mind and not just like making dots or putting straight lines and going with the contours. Any place I feel like I want to have a little bit uh, a little something different happening. Sometimes the, th the little sections get too samey. And that just helps you keep it a little bit more fresh. And go back in with my magenta pencil. I think this 
this might be a prickly pear cactus. Do you know your cactuses, Sarah? No, I don't. And I think I'll maybe use some of this up here in our far away mesa. I like to be scribbly. I think it's fun when you can get that kind of texture in there. I'll try some of this too. It's kind of like a, what's it called? Papaya. Reinforce the vertical lines back there. I am dipping it. And I'm going to grab that flat brush one more time. I'm going to just grab some neutral for my palette. doesn't really matter what. I just want something that's kind of like a gray. So if I mix green and red, I get a pretty good gray. Just keep mixing around until I get something that looks pretty neutral. I think I'll add some something to my rocks here because they were looking a little too... Just plain. Just tint them a little bit. And then you can manipulate that. You can move it around a little bit. You can wipe it away if you don't like it. Oh, maybe another little rock in there would be nice. Maybe one over here. Okay, and if I wanted to do maybe one more thing, I could give the um, give the cactuses some like little prickles. Uh, I don't know if they'll really stand out very well. I don't think they're really gonna really gonna stand out. I could perhaps use the back of my brush, and maybe scrape out a few little prickles here and there. It's not going to work as reliably as with watercolor paper. Well, I guess what if I had wet all the area, but I don't want to wet all the area. So I'm just going to throw in a few little prickles as I can. Well, not all cactuses have prickles you can see. That's true. All right, I think I'm gonna call this done. So if you do uh, finish up your painting and then you want to do something with the corners, if you just tacked them down the corners, uh, you could also use like a little bit of double-sided tape on the back, uh, but you probably wanna leave it on that board until it dried completely. Otherwise you could like just dump your, your paint. Um, just take a damp brush and you can just activate the paint in the corners and just kind of drag it out to the edge. Or you could pick some up off a palette and drag it over if you want. Generally, you'd have that part would be under a mat anyway, but if it's not, if you're going to mount it or you're just going to tape it up to the wall or something because it's really lightweight, you can do that. Um, if you needed to highlight anything, these little rubber tools are good. You can also use a Q-tip to wipe anything out. That works really well. Or a little balled up paper towel while it's still wet. You can pretty much wipe anything off. And of course, you can wet it and wipe the whole thing off if you don't like it and you want to change it. So um, I'll show you the finished painting here because that one's all dry so you can get a good idea of how it's going to dry. I'll just kind of show you some close-ups here so you can get an idea of the texture. I took that magenta pencil and I actually just did some scribbling here because I liked I liked the movement of it. I like thought of it kind of like drawing the viewer down the path, maybe over the dune off to the canyon. I don't know. And I was able to do some little little thorns just with a little brown pencil, I think, there. And the interesting texture. This right here is where there was a water droplet. And I thought, I'm just going to let that dry and see what happens. And it just gives you a little water spot there. So this would be a fun way to do backgrounds, too. If you just wanted to do a background, you could do your background, let it dry. Then you can actually um, draw your image and then use a, um, a wet cloth to erase your image area and then do your focal painting. You could totally get back to the white of the paper. So that might be an interesting um, 
project if like maybe you wanted to paint a big white lily and you wanted to have a crazy background you could do that crazy background and once it's all dry you could wipe away just like the silhouette of the lily and paint that in but um just to give you some ideas to think about uh the next time you want to try upo paper everything's linked down below also there's a link to my shop jason got my shop going if you're interested in the february paintings of the month they are there and then in march we'll have a new selection so um if you're interested in anything uh, you can get it so there Any, anything to add uh, no, oh, we're all caught up on questions. All right, wonderful. Well, thank you guys so much for um, stopping by. Until next time, happy crafting.